This is the maintainer track talk for SIG Auto Scaling. I'm very honored to be representing SIG Auto Scaling. I'm Jack Francis. Uh, I work at Microsoft. As I go through a bunch of slides with a ton of information, uh, it might not be clear that the, re the real reason we're here is to um, try to expose the community to potentially new members, invite new contributions. So if I fail to do that in the slide content, please um, know that that's the, the purpose of these talks. We want to make the project um, transparent, expose what we're working on, share that we've got lots of problems to solve in the future, and we'd love to have your help. Okay, that's me. It's superfluous to put a picture of myself on the screen because you can just look at me, but um, now you get to see my son Jerome as well. This is an example of horizontal biological auto-scaling. It's a good audience. All right, a uh, quick overview of what we're gonna talk about. I actually did this agenda first and then all the content later, so it might not match up exactly, but basically, I'm gonna introduce you to the SIG. We're gonna talk um, at a high level uh, and a visual level about auto-scaling concepts, how they work. Um, brief mention of uh, Carpenter one year later. So Carpenter joined SIG auto-scaling last year, so it's been super great to have them in the community. Um, some stuff about DRA. Uh, sh quick show of hands, does anybody know what DRA is? I know you do, Patrick, that's cheating. Anybody seen any good DRA talks? Oh, there's lots of them. Cool. Um, we'll go up, go through project updates. There's a lot of projects in Sagato Scaling, so that'll be kind of a quick um, run through of things that have happened in the last six months, maybe 12 months. Future work and um, some specific examples of where you can help, but uh, just generally speaking, you can definitely help. All right, so um, introduction about SIG Auto Scaling. The, the, the charter of SIG Auto Scaling kind of cuts across two uh, dimensions. One is clusters and one is workloads. In clusters, we have projects like Cluster Auto Scaling and Carpenter. And for workloads, we have Horizontal Pod Auto Scaler or HPA, Vertical Pod Auto Scaler or VPA, a uh, emerging uh, proposal called Multi-Dimensional Pod Auto Scaling, which is the two previous things combined into one. There is a prototype project called Balancer that uh, SIG Autoscaler uh, governs that would love some help. It's sort of stalled, so we can talk about that briefly. And then Atom Resizer, which is, uh, if you've been in Kubernetes for a long time, you'll know that's been around for a long, long time. So real brief overview of Cluster Autoscaler. Cluster Autoscaler monitors for pending pods and increases node pool replicas in response. It removes underutilized nodes when um, uh, respecting PDBs and other constraints, uh, other scheduling constraints. If, if nodes are underutilized, it can find a way to uh, run the same operational footprint, um, or I should say the same operation requirements with a uh, lesser operational footprint. Um, and it does so by performing scheduling simulations based on the um, declared config in those pending pods. Okay, Carpenter. Carpenter is a sort of sister solution for cluster auto, for uh, auto scaling a cluster. Carpenter similarly monitors for unschedulable or pending pods, and it provisions nodes in response. So if we go back and forth to this slide, there's a key difference there in that first bullet point: increases node replicas versus provisions nodes. So I'm not going to talk too much about that, but um, basically, Carpenter is sort of an all-up infrastructure provisioner. Cluster auto scaler is designed more to assume a homogeneous. Um, horizontally scalable node pool. Sorry for the gesturing in the mic. Um, uh, and it simply increases the replica, re replica count or decreases the replica count as appropriate. So uh, yeah, basically the same as, as uh, cluster autoscaler except for that key difference. Okay, moving on to horizontal pod autoscaler, another project under SIG autoscaling. Horizontal pod autoscaler, um, I'll call it HPA from now on because it'll be quicker. HPA increases and decreases pod replicas to uh, achieve a particular target. So it can scale on um, the standard resource metrics, C CPU and memory. It can uh, scale on custom met metrics. There's an example here for QPS. You can imagine any type of custom metrics um, that you could define or external uh, metrics, and there's an example here for Q length. Um, Configurable scaling behaviors, so uh, this is just to say that you can uh, tune scale up and scale down, or I, I, should, I, should, I should rephrase that, to scale out or scale in. Um, 
discreetly. So you can scale out more aggressively, scale down less aggressively. It's a common pattern. Okay, VPA, vertical pod autoscaler. So um, VPA essentially does the same thing as the horizontal pod autoscaling in response to operational triggers, but instead of creating more pods, it uh, creates bigger or smaller pods. And I'm going to read through this. The, the balance, this balancer project is meant to address um, more complicated pod distribution um, in a uh, cluster autoscaler enabled cluster. So um, how to ensure equal spreading of pods in three zones of a region with fallback and rebalance. These are some examples. How to split pods uh, 70 to 30% between spot or preemptible or regular VMs. For example, only use regular instances of spot instances are not available. How to consume node types with negotiated rates or discounts first, and then fall back to maybe vanilla node types. Uh, and then, or how, how to horizontally and vertically autoscale such deployments and make cluster autoscaler work well with them. So these are some sort of problem statement examples that this project is trying to address. There is a, a prototype in place. There's a V1 Alpha 1 um, implementation of this, but if this sounds interesting to you and you are a cluster autoscaler stakeholder or user, uh, this project could use your help and that would be fantastic. Atom Resizer, as I mentioned earlier, this one's been around for a long, long time. So this, uh, as it states here, simply vertically scales a singleton pod proportionally to the scale of a cluster. So the sort of canonical example, you've, if you've operated Kubernetes clusters before, you may have used this for metric server. It's super common in metric server. Um, where the resource needs to scale linearly or exponentially with the size of the cluster. Um, core DNS could be another example of that. So there's a point here about it can use nodes or containers as the metric to drive scaling. Okay, so that was a quick uh, breeze through the, the projects that SIG Autoscaling um, is responsible for. So now I want to, this is sort of the key conceptual point I wanna hit home today. So. The reason there are all these projects uh, isn't because you choose one or the other, but it's because they each solve a discrete part of the overall problem set. So I have this slide here that uh, I don't know what these arrows really represent, but this is a, a, a happy family of HPA plus VPA plus Cluster Autoscaler or Carpenter all working together to make your cluster more dynamic and optimally operational at all times. So we're gonna go through some fun um, visual uh, boxes here. So in this example, I'm gonna start out with a cluster, or I should say a node pool, with three nodes um, that is fairly densely packed. So when something happens, so on, on one of the parent pods deployment, we have defined an HPA resource, um, which is how you use HPA, and a trigger happens to uh, scale out an additional pod according to metrics thresholds being exceeded. So this pod on the right, is a pending pod, which then gets scheduled onto um, the node which has available capacity. So now our node pool is fully packed. Um, you could say it's optimally packed. Another example, um, let's go back to where we started. So same node pool, nicely optimized, just a little bit of overhead, and now one of the parent deployments um, on pod P22 has a VPA defined against it. That metric threshold is exceeded, that triggers a VPA scale up to meet utilization needs, and now our cluster looks like this. Okay, so going back to our almost fully packed cluster, um, one, or more HPA, one or more HPAs defined on one or more apps in the, pod, in the pool trigger a scale out, resulting in more pod overhead than the node pool is able to service. So uh, if these shapes are meaningful, which for the purposes of this demonstration they are, you can imagine there's one, there's, a, there's pod overhead of one pod on, in the entire node pool on node three, but we need four pods. Um, there, there is a request for four pods. So at this point, the scheduler is able to find room for one of those pods, but not the remaining three, and this triggers cluster autoscaler to add a new node to host those three nodes. Or this triggers Carpenter to add a new node to schedule those three pods. So, um, there's a difference here. In, in the cluster autoscaler scenario, we assume, we're, we're talking about a node pool here, we assume that the next node is gonna look exactly like the ones that preceded it. In the Carpenter scenario, we may decide that we can get uh, the 
sufficient infrastructure to service these pending pods with a smaller node, um, or maybe that represents a cheaper node, but a different node than um, some nodes that are in its peer group. Okay, so now we're gonna start from a different baseline, a fully packed node pool. So uh, let's imagine that we're just beyond peak business hours period, and at this point in time, node pool utilization has begun to subside, but all the pods are doing sufficient work. So the, the cluster is densely packed with pods, but perhaps not entirely hot. So at some point in the near future, utilization continues to drop, which eventually results in HPO, eventually results in an HPO floor threshold being triggered. So for those certain applications, a scale in event occurs. So now we see that our cluster is less densely packed. Correspondingly, so we're in the same cluster, we might have some applications configured to do work that is less real-time sensitive, for example, batch processing, and they may be configured for VPA. So now they opportunistically can grow themselves to do more work as their multi-tenant application peers take a breather. So we see some VPA scale up events happening on these nodes, on some of these pods, to take advantage of that extra overhead that now exists. Later, utilization eases and those apps scale back down. And even later, node pool utilization has lessened to the point where we now have significant de decrease in pod density, including an entirely empty node, not including daemon sets. So imagine that there are daemon sets and the configuration is all hygienic and we deal with those gracefully. So cluster autoscaler now is able to optimize the node pool and remove unnecessary infrastructure. So we've gone from three nodes with five pods to now one node with five pods. And I'm gonna give the carpenter the same, same carpenter example. Carpenter may be, even, be, even to, may be able, able to do it even better than that. Okay, so all that is to say that HPA, VPA, and cluster autoscaler or carpenter are complementary. Successful cluster and node pool scaling requires a cooperative configuration between all three actors. Okay, so we're gonna go back one, a little bit more visualization. So it's worth mentioning that one of the key pieces of functionality plus ergonomics that Carpenter offers is something that it calls consolidation. A node pool may look like this with seemingly nothing to do, but maybe this is cheaper and equivalently performant. Or maybe this. Maybe this is the same cost, but more performant. So Carpenter Consolidation allows you to configure your uh, node pool to take advantage of these types of um, real-time opportunities that exist in the environment that you may be in to continually optimize your infrastructure for spend and performance according to how you want to configure it. Okay, so now we're on to the updates uh, part of this, the, the slide. So I want to talk a little bit about multi-dimensional pod autoscaler. So we've been talking a lot about HPA and VPA. So HPA and VPA are independent and not really uh, designed to work together. Um, it's possible to do that, but it's not really recommended. Um, how do you know uh, if you want to scale out or scale in according to overlapping um, metrics thresholds? So multi-dimensional pod autoscaler allows com combining HPA and VPA scaling on a single workload, so you can imagine it's going to explode the API quite a bit to um, enable that complexity and that cooperation between the two dimensions. It's intended to provide, to prevent undesirable cases like large numbers due to HPA scaling of low CPU requests, of low CPU, CPU request pods due to VPA then scaling down. It's designed to be extensible, allowing users to insert their own recommender, encapsulating business logic, et cetera. So we can imagine in all that crazy Tetris logic, logic that we saw earlier, um, with something like multi-dimensional pod autoscaler, you get um, sort of real-time optimizational densities happening across both dimensions simultaneously. So this is currently in proposal status. Um, the AEP is 5342. AEP stands for Autoscaling Enhancement Proposal. Uh, we would definitely love help implementing this, so if anyone finds this appealing or if it solves a problem for you, please let us know. We would love to kickstart this. It is, there is some blockage on upstream Kubernetes. Uh, there's a cap, a long cap for in-place vertical pod autoscale, or in-place in pod um, resizing. So that's sort of in line with this, but you can also help with that too. Okay. Uh, 
talk about Carpenter really quickly. So Carpenter hit V1, so that's incredible. Are there any Carpenter maintainers, maintainers here, contributors? Probably not maintainers, I know them. Thanks, Mike. So Carpenter's at V1. If you've been waiting for a totally boring API to use Carpenter, the time has arrived. V1 was released over the summer, so that's a, a really great milestone for the project. There's also two new providers. Uh, one is AKS, which is going to GA behind a feature called node auto-provisioning in Q1 2025, I see some folks from AKS, so I'm just gonna throw that out there, and they can scold me afterwards for giving dates. Um, but it's an open source project, so you can contribute to that, um, and there are ways to, to smoke test that, either in your staging environment or, you know, talk to your AKS representative. But that's, it's really great to have the, the provider ecosystem expanding for Carpenter, and in addition, I'm looking right now at the maintainer for a new cluster API Carpenter provider. So this is, uh, has the opportunity to really expand the infrastructure opportunity in a single provider for, for Carpenter. So folks who are in um, GKE, for example, running CAPG with uh, the CAPG Carpenter provider, you can now leverage Carpenter in your GKE environment without having to write your own GKE specific provider. So that project uh, is a opening open to contributors, Mike? I, Absolutely, yes. Oh, wow, thank you. Life moves fast. So Mike, uh, let me know that an Alibaba provider also landed. So it's great to see new providers in the Carpenter ecosystem. Uh, real, real quick, three, three RFCs. Um, these are, you know, you can call these KE uh, Carpenter enhance, Enhancement Proposal, but there's an overlap with KEP, so RFC is the, the lingua franca for the Carpenter community. So there's a capacity reservations RFC that landed, a node auto repair RFC that landed, and a node overlay RFC that landed. I've put a link to the project so you can get more information about that. But the, the Carpenter project is definitely maturing, but also uh, simultaneously moving forward. So lots of great stuff happening there. Okay, um, I wanna put a slide in here as a project update um, that is overlapping with the serving working group. So the serving working group has uh, it's been formed in response to all this fun AI stuff happening across basically every dimension of the Kubernetes, Kubernetes landscape, and a bunch of SIGs, including SIG Auto Scaling, are serving that mission. So for SIG Auto Scaling, uh, this is just an overview describing auto scaling sort of stakeholdership within WG Serving. Um, we need to make sure that for AI serving workloads, that we understand auto scaling needs, techniques, and nuances of running inference workloads. Um, so inference and serving are somewhat synonymous there. Breaking down the various user objectives in tense and how each influences how one could set up auto-scaling. Coming together and sharing knowledge around optimizing the quickly changing landscape of inference workloads. So this is a really important part of the mission for both serving and device management, finding folks. If you're doing this, please come to these working groups and share your scenarios um, to make sure that you inform the APIs um, now closely collaborating with the various initiatives, so uh, Autoscaling is collaborating with a benchmarking initiative that came out of serving, um, best practices uh, being rendered in a public serving catalog, which are sort of examples um, of various use cases, how to compose all the solutions for, for practical work, and um, a new LLM inference gateway uh, work stream that's coming out of serving. So there's a lot of great stuff in um, serving. Okay, I should probably just give the mic over to Patrick, but I'll do my best here. So I stole this, these slides from John uh, uh, Bellamark from Google, who did the talk for WG Device Management. So as I mentioned earlier, um, DRA is a big thing for SIG auto scaling because uh, DRA has gone beta in 132, and um, the necessary changes to allow SIG auto scaling, to, uh, to allow cluster auto scaler to consume that work, and also Carpenter, um, uh, also landed in 132, so we are, uh, frantically, um, but also very responsibly landing the necessary changes in the cluster autoscaler project to ship a 132 with DRA enabled. So I want to just do a quick overview of what DRA is. So DRA is, um, and this is a really nice phrasing, it's a new Kubernetes API to describe services, so that is um, exposed as a new CRD called a resource slice. It's a new Kubernetes API to request devices. These are described as resource claims. Um, I may as well read the examples, I think they're good. So part one, the describing services. So for example, this device is an nvidia.com slash GPU. Its product ID is, I'm not gonna read that, an A100 SKU. It has uh, 
40 gigabytes of memory and 3456 FP64 cores. So um, we have a new API that can describe all of that, which we don't before DRA. Uh, we also have a newer e uh, API to describe something like, I need an NVIDIA GPU with at least 30 gig gigabytes of memory and at least 3000 FP64 cores. So that's what a resource claim um, exposes as a standard API to users. Uh, we are updating the scheduler to match requests to devices. That's obviously very, very, very important. So we can create that affinity between, uh, say, a resource claim and the actual uh, node running a resource slice that has the, those capabilities. And uh, we have a new Kubelet API to actuate the scheduler's decisions. So hopefully that's not too much densely packed information for DRA for folks who are new. Um, but uh, there's a little bit more supporting stuff here. So at the, at the bottom here, there's some interesting examples of how you might compose um, and or decompose, depending on how you want to put it, various GPU um, application use cases. So we have examples here with, say, uh, a workload that's running on two, two pods, one container each, one GPU per container. Here's another example of one pod with two containers with a shared GPU. That's something really can't do pre-GPA, uh, DRA. Here's an example with two pods, one container each, one shared GPU, and then one pod, one container, one claim, four GPUs per claim. So those are four examples. There's four million other examples of the combinatorics you can imagine. But all of this is available in a standard API called DRA, which is going to make uh, Kubernetes on AI much, much more ergonomic and flexible and powerful um, given all the complexity and, and resource constraints that we have. I'm going to skip past this just to make sure. OK. Quick project update for VPA. So VPA is um, uh, in, one in, one in one three zero, V1 beta 2 APIs will no longer be included in releases. So this is just a sort of PSA that we continue to remove beta APIs in uh, VPA. So again, V1 beta 2 will uh, not be available starting with one three zero. High availability capability was introduced in 1.2.0, so that's the latest release. And um, there is an ongoing AEP for in-place VPA. I mentioned earlier about multi-dimensional pod auto-scaling. So this um, is blocked on needs on the uh, in-place pod vertical scaling, SIG node, uh, cap slash implement. It's, it's, there's a bunch of implementation details that you can look into. Um, as far as we can, we can tell the earliest implementation for that would be 133. Hi, Derek. Is that Derek? No. Joel. Hey, Joel. Beta in okay, great. So Joel shares that uh, AE, that the in-place pod vertical scaling will be beta in 132. That's great update information. Thank you. So that should unlock. So if you're interested in this um, from a VPA perspective, come help out. Looks like the the dam is broken. Okay. Cluster autoscaler. So. Um, in 131, a implementation of proactive scale up landed. In 131, also provisioning request v1 landed. In 131, a new expander lease nodes landed. And um, as I mentioned earlier, in 132, by hook or by crook, we're going to land DRA. Uh, just a quick expansion of that previous slide. Um, so an expander is a different strategy for selecting the node. Um, the node group or node pool uh, based on pending pods. So a typical cluster running in production is going to have, a scale is going to have lots and lots of different node pools. And in a cluster uh, autoscaler situation, those node pools are going to be, each pool is going to be a distinct type of infrastructure. So expanders help to, to find the right pool to schedule a pending pod to. Um, so now we have, uh, in the cluster autoscaler project, six expanders. We have random. We have most pods, least waste, least nodes, price, and priority. And these are also uh, composable together by priority. So there's a lot of options there for cluster autoscaler. Is the GRP C expander not? <clears throat> Mike mentions that GRP expander did not get any love. Also GRP, GRP C expander. OK, help wanted. So uh, I've been mentioning this, help wanted. We want help for um, v VPA as, as 
uh, asked me to send out a call for help for vertical pod autoscaling for workloads with heterogeneous uh, resource requirements. So there's a link to the issue there. This slide will be uploaded, uploaded to the, the KubeCon uh, website if you want to get access to this content, or you can always just talk to us. Uh, for HPA, for HPA configurable tolerance, that's a, um, so HPA exists in, the, in the, the main Kubernetes code base. So for just a brief history overview, HPA uh, was introduced when Kubernetes had all of its componentry sort of in tree. VPA landed at a later date when things were being split out. So the, the configurable tolerance proposal is a KEP, not an AEP. It's KEP 4951. Um, we would love help on that if anyone is interested in HPA configurable tolerance. Definitely want help on DRA. Um, I'm definitely especially calling out for testers. So if you have uh, A100s in your staging environment and you want to start using DRA, please start testing. Reach out to us. We'd love to know how this is working. Um, and especially from a cluster autoscaler perspective, we'd love to you know, work with you to give you um, alpha builds to help get some mileage on that. I've added uh, a muscle emoji, a wood emoji and a bucket of water emoji. So uh, any of those things are very much well uh, help uh, welcome in the next sort of month or so before the 132 release. So come help, help us out, hang out with us. Uh, here is uh, the boilerplate for how to get involved. So um, SIG information is available on that really long link. Um, you can Google Kubernetes SIG autoscaling like I usually do. But that has uh, the, as it does with all SIGs, um, all of the necessary detail about how to get involved in SIG autoscaling meets weekly. Um, if you live on the West Coast like me, it's Monday mornings at 7 a.m. It's a pretty exciting time to get up and talk about autoscaling. Um, so come hang out with me, especially if you're on the West Coast, wake up early like I do. Um, and how to you know, join the Google group and all the, the stuff that, if, if you're familiar with how SIGs work. We're on SIG autoscaling on Kubernetes Slack and Carpenter on Kubernetes Slack. Uh, a link to test grid there, that's our test coverage. Go look at that and criticize it and then add more test coverage. That would be amazing. Here's a link to the Carpenter. The Carpenter is a very pretty uh, homepage which describes things in a sort of producty way but also has tons and tons and tons of, tons of great documentation. And here's the last slide with the QR code. Do we have time for questions? When is this? Did I go all the way? I'd love to answer any questions. We have a couple minutes, I've been told. There's a mic there. Or and there. Uh, I, is this on? I can hear you, yes. OK. Uh, I came in a little bit late, so apologies if you already covered this. Uh, is the multidimensional autoscaler intended to supersede? the others, or is it intended to use them on the back end or to be a different thing of its own entirely? Great question. So definitely no to the previous question. So Adam Resizer is a great, I think, concrete example of what happens to useful projects um, that eventually are functionally superseded by later projects that provide more functionality. It, sti it sticks around for folks who want to continue using that surgical tool. Um, so HPA and VPA, as far as I can tell, will stick around for a long, long time. The extent to which they, uh, there is reuse opportunity in the HPA and VPA actual source to inform how multidimensional pod autoscaling shapes up is TBD. Um, but I, I, it will definitely be its own CRD and its own operator, like some, something like VPA and HPA. But it, there, if there's reuse opportunity, then I would imagine that would be uh, welcome. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Alex. Um, we're using uh, lots of the autoscaling for um, GPU inference workloads, right, which is probably not surprising. Um, one of the things that I'd love to figure out is, um, we actually looked into the DRA feature kind of on a high level, um, but uh, the, the question that sticks in the back of my mind is to say, all right, many of the metrics that you use for scaling GPU workloads are not your typical, say, like CPU or memory uh, metrics. That's right. So is there any kind of plan to have some standardized uh, GPU metrics that can be used for autoscaling, or will we always be using our own custom metrics here? That's a great question. I don't know about always, but so the I mentioned earlier in the slide, there's a, 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 a serving catalog, which came out of the working group serving. 
So that would address the, the inference sort of scenario you're discussing. And the aim there is to start providing concrete examples of things like custom metrics. And we hope to marshal from the community a set of common metrics. Maybe those matric matriculate into the, into the core project. But um, I think for right now, the, um, the best way to approach that is to get super comfortable with how to define custom metrics in Kubernetes. You know, I, I imagine you're talking things like token latency, those types of metrics, yeah. So those are not standardized right now. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that, that uh, it would be uh, discouraged from finding out the best metric solution for your own use case. But I would expect, I would, if you want to bring those, those solutions that you find in custom metrics to the serving working groups, um, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, they would definitely welcome getting access to those reference examples. So that would be mainly for the uh, serving working group and not so much for auto scaling? Well, f for right now, that's right, yeah. Okay. The, I, the, the notion is eventually a working group um, disbands when it, its mission is complete and then the relevant SIGs would take over responsibility. Hi. Um, I had a question, uh, you know, if you could talk a bit about manual scaling or proactive scaling support in Carpenter and what the plan is there. Manual scaling. So. Yeah. Um, can I reclassify that as, as uh, so like something like pre-provisioning or? Yes. Pre yeah, I don't, I don't think I have an updated status. I do, I, I, is there an RFC in the queue right now for Carpenter for, for pre-provisioning or? I've seen a design for something like a Headroom API. Um, but yeah, I, I, I initially wrote that. So that was a while back. Um, right. So the, the, uh, I haven't been as involved in that in the sort of year and a half since I initially wrote that. But mm -hmm. if you are interested in that, I, I, I would say discover what the canonical issues are in the project and, and just plus one or add your use case sure. to um, try to create some inertia for that solution. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, so a quick question about um, auto scaling, so either cluster auto scaler or carpenter um, based on um, node, node local information such as local storage. One of the problems that we've hit repeatedly is that there s doesn't seem to be currently a good solution for auto scaling based on, um, and when I say local storage, I mean local storage available through CSI and through the CSI spec, not ephemeral local storage. And the, it, it seems like in the past there, there have been some discussions on, on, on GitHub about similar problems that, that they kind of um, faded away, so I was just curious if, if there is any conversation about that um, or any plans to support this in the future. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have any. I don't think I have anything interesting to offer right now on that question. Is it sounds like Mike wants to talk to you about that. Fantastic. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for your talk. Uh, a question around also Carpenter a little bit and support for custom resources or, yeah. I think there been a proposal about not templates or something or not overlays to, which kind of touches a little bit this topic as well so that for different nodes you can specify that they may have additional custom resources and then consume them as well. Yeah, again, I don't, I, I don't feel like I can't answer that question. Um, sorry, is that, is, are you, are these custom resources representing workloads? Uh, so th these inform the scheduler. Yeah, yeah, this is for scheduler to be able here. So I would imagine is a, is the normal approach where you would have a scheduler plugin or something like that 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 exposes awareness of those custom resources. Is that yeah? Not there there with would Carpenter? be something either daemon set or whatever. There would be a way later to modify the node and tell that it it has certain capacity for custom resource, but for uh, right now, basically uh, this approach is kind of blocked because. Um, Carpenter cannot decide which node to pick up when there is a resource request for this customer source on the on the definition for workload. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I, yeah, apologies, I can't answer that. Sounds like a great thing to bring into Slack. I'm sure they would love to talk about that. Are we at time? Okay. Thanks, everyone.